Um, three parts that are, uh, three main points that I would like to make. One is that Islamophobia is a structural form of oppression driven by securitization. Secondly, the global CVE program is the greatest challenge in the context of this discussion about Islamophobia. And we will explain how and why. And lastly, we will try to discuss ways to tackle Islamophobia, inshallah. So first point is that Islamophobia generated by state policies. This is what we want to concentrate on. And at great risk of earning the um, wrath of uh, Marwan, I, I do want to present the meaning of Islamophobia. But in a very simple way. It's um, two things. Uh, one is the individual acts of hate, aggression and abuse. Uh, you can tell I'm not an academic, I'm not a theoretician. I don't have many um, big words or models to explain. Very simple. One is individual acts of hate and aggression that you experience at the street level or individual level. And two is the structural and institutional discrimination that is not visible. Okay? I'm here, I don't have any marks on my body. Nobody spat at me yesterday. There's nothing to prove that I've been subjected to an Islamophobic treatment. But that's how structural Islamophobia works. It's invisible, but it's everywhere. And it's designed to exclude and discriminate against Muslims based on a narrative driven by securitization discourse. Um, this is an email that I received about two, three weeks ago. It's from my insurance company, who I insure my car with. They're basically writing to me and saying, reassuring me, that, please, Muhammad, don't worry. You may have read some reports in the news that we charge £1,000 more to those customers whose first names begin with Muhammad. But we can assure you, you have not been charged extra. All right? That again, you cannot see the effects of that structural violence on your person. But this is actually structural oppression and discrimination against Muslims. So one analysis amongst practitioners and academics who study this is that the root cause of Islamophobia is two things. Firstly, it's the far right pushing the agenda of hate against Muslims. And secondly, it's actually our own Muslim people carrying out political violence, which then creates a backlash. Now, that has then leads to two more conclusions. We must counter those racists. Like in Britain, we have the English Defence League, Britain First and other people like that. And secondly, we must make sure we distance ourselves from those crazy, wacky Muslims who are carrying out uh, terrorism uh, or political violence. But this is, has some limitations. Just two points I'll point out. Firstly, the war on terror began in 2001. What you see today, the world didn't look like it back in 2001. By 2001, there were Muslim men being picked up all over the world without due process or any access to human rights or any legal system. Guantanamo Bay prison is still open today. Our organization was started first to campaign for the closure of Guantanamo Bay. It's still open after all these years. Now, Trump wasn't president, and the far right were not in ascendancy. But the war on terror created the climate and the ingredients where, which the far right and racist capitalized on. And this is one of the main points. Secondly, we are at an international conference. We must have also the global view. Right now in China, there are 800,000 Uyghur Muslims being held without charge or trial. There is no far right presence in China, but there is rampant Islamophobia, structural Islamophobia. The same in India, Sri Lanka, the same in uh, Burma or Myanmar. So Islamophobia exists even in some Muslim countries. When the Saudi state decides to ban a legitimate organization saying that it's violent and political and terrorist, you know that this is Islamophobic policy in action. So basic point is the war on terror plus racism in the West at least creates structural Islamophobia that's the cause and that then leads to what you see on the everyday streets and on social media the hate and everything else that is what primes and legitimizes all the hatred that you see why that's important for us to recognize is then we have to then concentrate our attention and focus on root causes 
if we want to make a real long-term change. The war on terror has been around for a long time. Dick Cheney said when it began that this is going to go for 50 years. So we're still in the very beginning phase. We don't know when it's going to end. It exists and it's so part of our reality we don't even realize it's there. We don't even mention it. 40% of the world's countries are right now involved in the US-led war on terror. 40% of the world. They have invested huge amounts of political and economic capital to this policy. It will not be easy to shift from that direction. And in order for the war on terror to exist and continue, there needs to be a narrative that allows for that policy to continue. And this policy is on two fronts. There is foreign policy, which is carry out wars in the Muslim countries and support the dictators and tyrants in the Muslim countries. This creates blowback where some Muslim groups carry out retaliatory actions, which creates hatred and so on. And secondly, there's a domestic... I mean, this is one of the heads of these intelligence agencies in Britain. The government and the politicians have gone against, repeatedly gone against the advice of the intelligence agencies, who have repeatedly said, if you continue violent intervention in Muslim countries and carry out war, there will be a national security problem. Okay? So, political, so domestic policy also, therefore, is rooted in securitized narrative and discourse. The narrative is very simple, and it has to be this. If it's not this, the war on terror and all those military and economic interests will have to collapse. The narrative is simple. Islam causes violence. And our earlier speaker this morning, Dr. Ibrahim, uh, made this point very, very well. And he linked it to the historical experience of Muslims encountering the West. The more Islamic a Muslim is, the higher the propensity to be violent. There is no evidence to suggest this. There are no facts about this. But this is the belief system that the Western policymakers carry. Therefore, all Muslims are potential terrorists, and therefore they must be treated with suspicion. This creates exceptional treatment of the crime called terrorism. Okay? We heard earlier on about the law. Now, you will be maybe shocked, maybe you're not shocked. There are laws in the West, I can speak from the UK experience, they operate outside of the rule of law they will criminalize you and keep you in prison without any evidence based on something called secret evidence. All right? So, uh, quickly moving on, um, I want to cover a few policy examples of securitized discourse in action. Um, and there are six. Very quickly, I'll go through them. Guantanamo, I don't need to make the point. It exists outside of any legal framework and is allowed to exist and it is a stain on American government and the Western countries as a whole, that they cannot close this torture camp. Prevent is a policy in the UK. There are stories of four-year-old kids that are questioned by counter-terrorism officers. This is one of our clients. We deal with 200 Prevent clients a year. 7,000 children have been reported to Prevent only last year alone. And for what? In some cases, the child drew a cucumber with a knife where the, his father was cutting the cucumber. The teacher saw this and said, I must report this to the police because this child might be radicalized and one day might blow us up. Okay? We, um, some of this hopefully maybe I can take up in the discussion, but there, there are many um, policies that exist in the UK, such as this unit. We revealed the existence of a propaganda unit that carried out propaganda against Muslims using deception tactics within the community. There's also um, a secret study that was used by government to develop 22 indicators of extremism. This study was kept secret for years. Cage obtained this study and published those 22 indicators and was able to show there is no science behind it. The British government used this to create a two-hour workshop. They have used this workshop and trained one million public sector workers, doctors, teachers, social workers, to go into their jobs and to use the 22 indicators and to spot extremists who are going to become terrorists in the future. So what do you think happened? In two hours, you're not going to learn nothing. 
So what do you do? You're going to rely on your prejudices. The society has been primed to create hate and fear of Muslims and suspicion of Muslims. You're going to rely on those prejudices. So that's what happened. Muslims were being sent to counter-terrorism and being treated as suspects even though there's no crime. Many thousands of Muslim bank accounts are shut down without any accusation, without any reason. This is what happens when it's structural problem. It becomes normalized. Um, Muslim citizens are deprived of their citizenship without any due process. This man was removed of his citizenship, then kidnapped by the USA, and then tortured, then sent to the USA, where he's now serving uh, many years in prison. You have also security service harassment. Um, there are some laws. All of these laws, each one of them, is based on principles that contradict human rights law and the rule of law principles. Schedule 7, for example, I myself found myself in, 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 at court. I was arrested under Schedule 7, which is a power at police bo at borders. I was demanded to hand over my passwords. I refused, saying I have confidential information relating to torture survivors. I was threatened with three months in prison. Alhamdulillah, with the support of my colleagues at Cage and others, we decided we will challenge this. I ended up in court, and the judge gave me a verdict of conditional discharge, but convicted me under terrorism. You know, so um, Alhamdulillah, we didn't compromise our integrity. We didn't compromise the trust of all those survivors of torture. And we did not show that we are intimidated by this system that discriminates and targets Muslims. Um, this is a man who was studying terrorism studies at university, sitting at the cafe, and his, uh, some uh, staff saw him with terrorism books. They called terrorism police, all because he looked like someone who might go and carry out terrorism. He did nothing wrong. But that's what happens when you engineer a climate based on this assumption that Muslims are a threat to national security. Um, second main point, and I'll have to finish on this, the countering violent extremism program is the biggest challenge that I think I would like to place on all of your agenda. This is the equivalent of the PREVENT program that we have in the UK. And this program is based on the same framework that PREVENT operates to which is what I've been explaining, that the problem is with Islam. And the more religious a Muslim is, the more likely he's going to be violent. So better to start early and carry out what's called pre-crime, operate in the pre-crime space and stop them from becoming future terrorists. This program, through the UN, was made into a mandatory requirement for member states to implement, I think in uh, 2014. Uh, resolution 2178 but the problem with it is this idea of extremism is not defined so there is no agreed definition I mean people from the, from the UN themselves this rapporteur himself said that there is no agreed definition so what does that mean? it means that the vague concept can be used again and again for states to take away using the threat of um, Muslims to take away the rights and discriminate against Muslims and create a society which is um, more securitized and, and so on. So, um, I wanted to ask you a question actually. Um, 2016, 200 acts of political violence were carried out in the EU. Of those, how many were by Muslims? Does anybody know? Not you, Aman, because you already know the answer. Does anyone, can anybody take a guess? 200 acts of political violence were carried out in 2016 in Europe, according to Europol. How many were by Muslims? Take a wild guess. I will not embarrass you. 10. 10, yeah? Okay. Anybody else disagree? Only 10. Okay, only, actually, 2. Okay, this is not, this is data from Europol, the organization of all police organizations in Europe. They publish an annual report, only two acts of political violence were carried out by Muslims. But none of you and me would imagine that to be true. Because we are repeatedly sold this narrative about Muslims being connected to violence and terrorism. And the entire world agrees on this. 
and policies such as prevent and CVE are being developed on this. Now, if CVE was true, they should have a policy for the remaining 98. But the entire CVE program will be directed at Muslims, even though only two uh, were carried out. Now, um, the UK, you have to watch out for the UK because they are the leaders. They have developed the thinking, the policies, and they are, their template is being used by many, many European governments already. Finland, Sweden, uh, many other countries are using, copy-pasting the UK template. So you can learn a lot about CVE by studying the UK uh, experience. And I need to wrap it up. Um, um, so I just, I mean, the CVE exists in France, in Denmark, in Australia. There are some examples there. And um, in short, what we want to say is that state, states, even if they don't introduce new terrorism laws, they will adopt securitized narratives. Those narratives will then allow for policies to be created and for Islamophobia to be normalized. So if we're going to challenge the effects of Islamophobia, we must keep an eye on the cause. Okay? Not just the symptoms and the results, but the cause. And this means we'd be strategic. Okay? And this is where I would, I would request that um, we, we need to do this. Now, I think I'll, I'll stop there, uh, Marwan. I think I've run out of time. And some of these points um, we can carry, carry on in, in, in the further discussions. Thank you very much for listening. Assalamu alaikum.